Marty. I want to tell you that you're looking at a miracle here because if he would have called me just a few years ago, I would have said, sorry, if you have the wrong number, please. I have never been a public speaker. Uh, this is my first public speaking engagement other than in a church. But I'm so excited to be here. Um, I have a lot to share with you. And I wanted to say that you, as artists, are poised to earn a lot of money from your intellectual property, whatever that may be. If you're an artist, a photographer, oil painter, or whatever, uh, the sky's the limit. And I'm going to share some things with you that will hopefully motivate you and encourage you uh, to press on. I had to educate myself to do what I've done. And I want to encourage you to educate yourself too. Um, a college degree only tells your employer that you are smart enough to learn to conquer a learning curve. And at my advanced age, learning curves are getting harder and harder to, to conquer and overcome. But I want to say that educate yourself. Uh, I bought many, many, many books on publishing, mail order, and so on and so forth. Buy DVDs, CDs on your area of interest and study diligently. Um, if you have what I'll call a mindset that is holding you back, just press through and overcome that. I had such a negative impression and, and uh, negative value system that I held myself back. I was my own biggest enemy. But as I pressed through and as I learned and as doors opened for me, uh, I went from one level to another level to a higher level, learning more and experiencing more through my, uh, through my years. So I'm here to give you hope for a prosperous future. If you have a pen and paper, if you could write down my, uh, this website here. Uh, my son and I worked on this yesterday. We created a website for you. This is all resources for you, um, books, and I will be putting more on it in the, uh, in the days to come. And anybody can email me at neil at cypresscovepublishing.com. I'd like to uh, talk to you today about how to start a publishing business like I did from your kitchen table on a shoestring budget. My history in publishing, this will be part one. In 1977, I acquired the rights to this little report called How to Run Faster. It was written by a friend of a friend who tried out for the Olympics and, and running, and he took topics and, and things that he knew about that he wanted to share. And so I acquired the rights to this short report. I placed ads in Boys Life magazine and sports magazines. I sold it for $2, and I got addicted to getting money in my mailbox. 
So this is what started me on my career, so to speak. Next, in 1980, I wrote a book about the last days. It's all the scriptures you need to know about the last days, the study guide of end time scriptures. I, I worked on that for about a year. I typeset it myself. Uh, no, actually, we typed it out, then we sent it to a printer, and they printed um, the copies for me. I, that was in 1980. I ran a display ad you know what a display ad is. It was about one inch high and about a column width, which is about two, two and a half inches. So I ran a display ad in, um, in a Christian magazine, and I sold 500 copies at $1.95, plus 50 cents shipping and handling from the magazine ad. I got experience in the mail order way of doing business, where you get the money in your mailbox and you mail out the book. Plus, I sold some books in Christian bookstores. My goal and desire after that was to get a job with the post office. I tried three years to get hired. I took many postal exams. I went through the letter sorting machine training, but thankfully I failed. That is a story in itself. Um, I was dejected and depressed because I failed because here's a ten dollar an hour job back in 1977 or 1980 whatever it was that was a big deal to, to make ten dollars an hour but I didn't uh, I didn't get the job so uh, I at that time I got hired by the city of Lafayette as a mail clerk delivering mail to all of the city agencies fire police, Cajun Dome, and, and so on. So I had a stress-free job, and I could now plan my next move. So I had the freedom. I wasn't con con uh, worried and, and, you know, turned inside out because of, of no money. I had a job. I had money coming in. I could feed my kids. So my next move uh, was, was to come. President Reagan had fired the air traffic controllers in 1981, so I found a need and I filled it. There's an old saying, if you can find a need and fill it, okay, you, you, you can do something. So I started Career Preparation Center uh, in, I think it was 1987 or 88, and I sold an air traffic controller home study course in 1988. Some people put together this course on um, how to prepare from home to be an air traffic controller. So I thought this would be a good uh, start uh, to do what I wanted to accomplish. So I found out what city my competitor would run his ad. This was a big company who had mega bucks to spend on advertising. And so when I went to the, looked through the classified ads in the paper, I would always see their ad. So, so I found out what city he would be running his ad in and I would run mine next to his. This is an ad that appeared, that I wrote and designed, and it appeared in the Federal Jobs Digest. And I coded my ads, because right here it says P.O. Box, such and such dash FJD, which stands for Federal Jobs Digest. That way when the money and the, or the inquiries came in with that code, I knew that they saw it in the Federal Jobs Digest and I could chart where my money and was coming from, what ads were paying off. This was a short sales letter. It was a short four-page sales letter that I prepared saying, Dear Future Air Traffic Controller, and then I went on from there. And so the whole point of this was to sell the uh, home study guides. And so I sold, I don't know, maybe a hundred or so. I took the money that I made from the air traffic controller sales to print my first post office booklet, and I sold it for five dollars. This is the first one here. Little eight and a half by five and a half book, 
printed on regular copy paper. But in the inside of the book, lo and behold, I found another home study course to sell. And this was uh, a home study course on uh, how to get a job at the post office. <laughs> and so these, uh, these courses sold for uh, 50 bucks. So I had different uh, types of jobs, mail handler, rural carrier, and so on and so forth. So the purpose of the book was to not only make $5 from the sale of the book, but to make some back-end sales from the home study courses. And it worked, pretty, worked out pretty good. So eventually I wrote nine, nine different books here on different topics on how to get hired by the post office. Uh, I placed ads in military magazines because when a guy, at, at that time we had military bases around the world. And I would place ads in, say, <coughs> Air Force Times, Army Times. And when these military guys, would, would, when they knew they only had six months left in their gig, you know, to run, to, to stay in the, in the service, they'd start looking for a job. What am I going to do when I get out? And they would see my ad. And they would write to me, because in the ad I offered a free report, which included a sales letter, a brochure, um, and an envelope to return uh, and, and, you know, their information back to me. So uh, I got there, plus I, had a, I hired a, uh, an answering uh, a telephone answering company to take calls from around the world. And so they would write to me from that classified ad. I would take the money. Uh, I would take their name, type it into the computer. I had a friend of mine design a, a database to handle all of the inquiries. And so I would send out my email, uh, my, uh, my mail uh, responses and, and sales letters to them. Then I would get money back from them selling this set of books. <coughs> then. Um, these are, the, these are the nine books right here. Later, I bought out my competitor who lived in Florida for $2,000. I merged his two or three books that he had. I merged them with my booklets to create one big book, eight and a half by 11, 170 pages. I sold that for $20 plus $3 priority. Eight and a half by 11, 170 pages. I sold that for $20 plus $3 priority mail shipping. I created and sold, also created and sold audio cassette tape study tools for $10 each. Uh, plus, I had a free certificate that I gave them for when they got hired or if they scored high, like from 95 to 100 percent on the exams. I sold 3,000 of these, uh, either a combination of this one or the reports. I sold 3,000 over six years, which was $60,000 that I took in. So that averaged about $10,000 uh, $10, a year. After one year as a mail clerk, I got hired as a printing press operator for the city of Lafayette working in City Hall. And I applied for that job, I took the civil service exam, and I got hired because I knew I would need this in the future. Because I was in mail order, I was dealing with printing, tons of literature and sales letters and envelopes. So, and this is one of the uh, flyers that I did for the postal job book. And this was my sales letter that is a four-page sales letter. And the packet that I prepared, I got as high as a 19% response rate, which is absolutely incredible. Because people at that time were, were uh, hungry for a good job. I started my own 
Okay, I got a job working, I worked three years as a printing press operator. I bought a used press, a demo, put it in my house, and I started printing postcards and flyers for myself and for others. In 1990, I started a company I called Money Magnet Systems. I know that sounds kind of corny right now, but uh, it worked. Uh, it was a multi-level marketing recruiting system. We could enroll members into two MLM companies with one effort. And this is the booklet that I created. Here's two versions. There's 16 pages. 16 pages each. On the back of the uh, booklet, there's an application for them to sign, fill out, and send in to us, uh, to me at my office, and we would enroll them into this company. Well, two companies. One was a candy company, which was my, my partner's company, and the other one was a nutritional products company. We were in this business about four years. I sold 130,000 of these booklets. At the same time, I saw a need for a, a nutrition products catalog that was inexpensive, that could help the actual distributor. The company, well to backtrack, to start this company here, the Money Magnet Systems, I had a 386 computer. In fact, that was one of the first IBM compatible computers that were made. It cost me $2,000. I used, uh, I had a custom made computer program design. It worked on an ID code number system. I had the dealer number was printed on the postcard that the people mailed to op opportunity seekers on a mailing list. When that card came back to me, I wrote the dealer number right here in this corner and I, I filled it in uh, so that the, uh, the person who mailed the deal, he could get credit for it and enroll people into the program. So, bottom line was that the members of, of my organization, of my company, uh, they made money when these people enrolled into this company. And the multi-level marketing nutritional company and the candy company each mailed them a commission check. I printed at least 250,000 postcards on my printing press in my own home, sold 130,000 sales booklets, and as you can see, this is printed on regular newspaper, uh, newsprint. Yes. We were recognized at the, uh, the multi-level marketing nutrition product company's national convention in Houston for enrolling 800 members in only seven months. Here I am, the top left. That's what it looked like back then, <laughs> in 1990. Then I created a 16-page nutrition product catalog, again, on newsprint. It cost me 10 cents. I sold it for 40 cents. So you could either get 100 catalogs for $40 or 1,000 for $250. One afternoon, we had three people call to order a thousand each. So that was three thousand catalogs sold in about two or three hours. So I say thank God for credit cards. That, uh, that helped me out. So sold 140,000 total of these nutritional product catalogs. The nutrition products company sold their fancy color catalog for three dollars. So, when they saw the success that I was having, they got jealous and shut me down because they said that only we can sell our own product catalog, no, no imitators allowed. So, they shut me down, 
just as I mailed off my last 100 catalogs, I was completely out of inventory when they shut me down. So God is good. He was looking out for me. So I went to work for a local publisher in 1994. I worked there for 11 years. I learned the ropes. I got more on-the-job training. I helped him produce 16 books, including cookbooks. I started Cypress Cove Publishing in 2001. That's my logo. My first book was Cajun Country Fun Coloring and Activity Book. 32 pages. The images are, they were all done by Keith Duyon from Kaplan, Louisiana. He is a cartoonist, a very funny guy, very witty. And <clears throat> I had him, <clears throat> I had him create or write captions for each image. And once the captions were written, I went to a guy who translated them into French, Cajun French. So the book is unique in that the page numbers are in French. Here you see the page seven, you have the English word seven and the French word. And so the page numbers and the captions are both in English and French. So, as of today, I've sold over 10,000 of these. I quit my job and started on my own June 1st, 2005. I created the Down Home Cajun Cooking Favorites, which was printed by Thanksgiving. So it took me six months from start to finish to do this book. Now these are all compiled recipes from different sources. Uh, including uh, some from myself, my sister, my mom, and my dad. Each have some in there. So I sold 30,000 copies of that book to date. <clears throat> I had nothing else to do, so I wanted to do something else. Can I ask who you sold them to? These books here? Yeah, you sold them yourself. Retail. I sold them to retail stores. Retail. So I sold them wholesale, wholesale. wholesale to different retail stores across South Louisiana. This is an example of niche marketing. I walked into one of my retailers that uh, bought my coloring books, and uh, they said, okay, well, I see you have a coloring book, and I see you have a cookbook. Do you have any maps? She says, I keep getting requests from teachers. Uh, they want maps of uh, Louisiana or Louisiana parishes. So I said, no, I don't have any maps, but what do you need exactly? And she told me. And she said, I asked, well, what are you willing to pay for a map that's on this size paper with all of the parishes uh, in bold letters outlined so that the students can see? So she says, I believe the teachers can uh, or would be willing to buy this for five dollars each. So I said, you got it. So I went to work, and within two or three weeks, I had this printed up. I had a thousand, let's see. So I sold it to the stores wholesale for two dollars and fifty cents. The stores retailed them for four ninety nine. I printed one thousand maps I broke even after selling 225. So I sold the remaining $775 uh, for a profit of $1,937. Why am I telling you this? This is to get you inspired, motivated, to show you what can be done. Just, hey, y'all are at a creative meeting, right? Creative minds meeting. Y'all all have creative minds or you want to improve on your creativity. I'm giving you real life examples of what I have done and what you can do with uh, a little gumption, a little courage. So I had his originals digitized and made prints with his biography and art description on the back. So these are some of the uh, 
pieces that this is one of them. Call this Cypress Solitude <clears throat> on the back. I put a description of the art piece here, what it's about, in English, but the same description in French. I had it translated into French. His picture, his biography in English and in French here with a barcode. That way, when you sell it at a store, uh, they run it through the register, scan it, and they'll show up. So I sold these retail for $17.95. And um, here's some others. That one is called Cajun Homestead. Country Lane. This is Foggy Bayou Morning. Of course, I named these all myself. I had to uh, create a title for them. And the fifth one. Camp on the Point. This is something that you might see in the Chafalaya Basin or maybe around here. No, it's it's. Uh, I had these printed at Kinko's. Is this a print? They're print. It's got a cardboard right here. There's nothing on the inside. Just a cardboard backing, okay. and it's printed on acid-free paper, right. both sides. And how, how much is that? I uh, sold it, uh, they sold, the store sold it for $17.95, some sold it for $24.95, depending, but uh, it only cost me like a dollar, dollar and a half per, per copy. And who did it sell to the store? I sold it to different uh, stores around South Louisiana. You just called them up? Uh, yeah, I thought that they might be a good prospect. You look for places with high traffic. Uh, so <clears throat> I showed it to him. I said, yeah, we could sell that. So I had a, bought a little display rack at the um, office depot. And I put them standing up in the rack like this. And people came and bought them. Yes, put them up in sign. A few places took them on hot right sale. Meaning, you understand? Okay. Outright sale, for those who don't know, versus consignment. Consignment means you bring in a book and you leave, say, whatever quantity, five or ten, leave them there for free. You come back a month later and if they sold some, you write out an invoice and you charge them for what they sold and uh, you need more. Some, some stores won't take consignment. Right. So, it, I'll, I'll work both ways. Missed the. Uh, it messed up. It shut down. Shut down. It locked. It went to sleep mode. <coughs> I think that's what everyone So. So in 2006, we did this. Then the next thing I did, rice cooker meals, fast home cooking for busy people. Has anybody here heard of a rice cooker? All right, a lot of people, well, most of the people where I come from in southwest Louisiana, we had rice cookers starting back around the 1960s and 70s. And we used it just for cooking rice. Until I came across a recipe for some crawfish jambalaya uh, done in a rice cooker. And I said, wow, that looks interesting. So I took the recipe home and I tried it. I said, wow, I could do this. You know, I don't like standing in the stove babysitting a pot and stirring it. I'd rather put stuff in a rice cooker, press down the cook button, and go watch TV. Then when the button, when it finishes cooking, the button pops up and wait a few minutes, let, it, let the rice finish cooking and it's ready to eat. So I said, I think that's a great idea. I'm going to collect recipes uh, from people who have created 
you know, rice cooker recipes. And lo and behold, I only have about 10 people send me that contributed recipe. I said, well, I can't make a cookbook out of 10 recipes, so I said, I'll have to do this the hard way. So I had to start experimenting on my own, cooking, uh, putting in a variety of different ingredients that I thought would be tasty. So I put this together. I published it in 2008, and to date I've sold about 20,000 copies. Um, uh, Neil, do you do the same uh, method of placing it uh, uh, wholesale? Wholesale. Retail? Uh, the only retail that I did was I would go to Barnes & Noble every Christmas. Uh, let's say the, the Saturday after Thanksgiving was the best time for me. I would prepare four dishes ahead of time, and I would bring my rice cookers to Barnes & Noble, set it up on a table, and cook the, the meals. And the beautiful thing about that is, after it starts cooking, that aroma goes all through the store, and it goes outside the door, so that by the time the people are 15 feet away from the door, they can smell something wonderful. So they come in and they walk in the door and they're looking around. Oh, look, that guy's cooking something. And so they come, I offer them each a taste, and they'd be sold. You know, I love this, they say, you know. Did you do that retail? Being that I worked with Barnes & Noble, I'd say take the book and go pay the cashier. Oh, so, so, so Barnes & Noble made their cut, and I made my cut. So, how did you so, what? So, I had to get into Barnes & Noble. That's a pretty big store. I went and I'll talk to them. I talked to the, uh, the, the customer service representative okay. who deals with local people. And he, he saw my book. And, uh, uh, well, the book, I'll get to this in a minute, but the book was sold on lightningsource.com. And Barnes & Noble is a vendor, is a participating partner through the Lightning Source program. So um, <clears throat> they got their book at a, at a good rate, and I made, uh, I made a profit. I sold, the first time I did this, I sold 85 books in two hours by giving out samples of the food. And so they, uh, and it was, it was a good deal, you know. Uh, <clears throat> just recently, we took this 8 by 10 version of my Cajun cookbook, I revised it, I improved some of the recipes, and I made a revised second edition in a 6 by 9 version, the same size as this, and I increased the price to, well this was $7.95, I increased the price to $12.95, and at the same time we were working on that, I created my third book called Slow Cooker Meals. Uh, easy home cooking for busy people, not to be confused with rice cooker meals, fast home cooking for busy people. This is a fast cooker, this is a slow cooker. And so I created, uh, I took actually about 30 recipes from here that I know were proven family favorites. I converted them to work in a crock pot. So about 30 of these are mine. The rest were contributed by the LSU Ag Center Homemakers Clubs around the state, uh, north and south of Louisiana. So this sells for $12.95. And okay, what I wanted to do, almost done here. I wanted to show you part two, which is how you as an artist can make money. And he's coming up with this presentation pretty, pretty quick. Uh, one of the things I wanted to tell you is, okay, write this down, smashwords, smashwords.com, that's S-M-A-S-H-W-O-R-D-S, smashwords.com. 
Anybody can go there, follow their instructions on how to format your book and sell it through them. You make 85% of the retail profit, retail price. Uh, so if you have a ten, if you have a ten dollar book, you would make uh, eight dollars and fifty cents. Smashwords would make the other fifteen percent as their commission. They have a uh, computerized process where they take your word file. They don't take PDFs. They'll take a word file. They run it through their software to convert it according to their specifications, and they will take your book sell it on their website as an ebook. There are eight different formats that they provide. One of those is the Amazon Kindle. Uh, they do the EPUB format and several other formats. You can go there and read all about it. So if you have any kind of book dealing with uh, text, they don't take or work with <coughs> images like art books. They don't handle that very well. The next one that I can... What if you have a cookbook with pictures? Okay, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, I'm going by memory from my slideshow. Uh, if you have, if you want to do an art book, a book with words, you know, copy plus art images and so on, I would say the easiest way to do that is to go through Lulu, L U L U dot com. They, uh, I have never done anything through them, uh, but a friend of mine, uh, he wrote a genealogy book, and Lulu published it as a hardcover, and it's beautiful. It, it did a classy job, and. Uh, I think they're a good company. Uh, I, okay, another website to write down is Lightning Source. L I G H T N I N G Source is S O U R C E dot com. The reason I went with Lightning Source for my, I started with my Rice Cooker book in 2008. What attracted me to them is that they are owned by Ingram, which any bookseller knows who Ingram is. They are the largest uh, either wholesaler or distributor, I don't remember which, I think it's wholesaler. The largest book wholesaler in the entire world. Any bookstore who wants to order books, they'll call up Ingram and tell, me, tell them I want X number of books shipped to me and they'll normally get it within maybe three days. So I went with Lightning Source for this because they have, they'll call up Ingram and tell me, tell them I want X number of books shipped to me and they'll normally get it within maybe three days. So I went with Lightning Source for this because they have global distribution. They have a company, uh, a plant in England that handles all of Europe and Asia and Africa. And they have a plant in, um, in the States here, I think it's uh, Tennessee, that handles all of America. So the deal with Lightning Source, all right, let's see where we're at. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes. Okay. I also sell a Stainless steel rice cooker in the back of my book. Again, I'm, I like the back end sales. Got this uh, full page in the back of the book to sell the rice cookers. Uh, Ebooks. I created a free ebook for my rice cooker book. Uh, it's basically a 16 page sales letter to sell the rice cooker book online. I captured their email, I sent them a series of six autoresponder emails, which means it's an automatic software program uh, 
and you create six uh, follow-up letters, just encourage them to buy the book, plus you give them uh, news and, and recipes. This is the cover of my ebook that I put on my website uh, that's encouraged them to, uh, to sign up and give me the email for the uh, newsletters. This is me at one of the rice cooker meals um, uh, demonstrations where I cooked uh, some meals and I gave out some samples and sold some books. Our latest cookbook is Slow Cooker Meals, Easy Home Cooking for Busy People, $12.95. We also revised our down-home kitchen cooking favorites and made it 6 by 9 and $12.95 also. So all three books are now on Amazon.com. Now, how do you get it on Amazon.com? The way I did it was when I went through Lightning Source, who is my online publisher, you could say, they distribute the books worldwide, including uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Follett's College uh, Bookstore, uh, and a few others. Part two, how artists can make money. Number one, you can sell your originals or your prints in art galleries on consignment. You can leave them there for free. You can get a percentage of the retail sale. Normally it's 50%. Art licensing. Does anybody here understand or know or has ever heard of art licensing? Nobody. Good. For example, <clears throat> art licensing can deal with, if you are an artist and you have items that would make a good match with a, uh, a manufacturer to produce, say stationery, greeting cards, calendars, fine art prints, home decor, photography. You do the creative work and you produce uh, in some intellectual <coughs> property in the form of, let's say, my images here. Okay, I had a guy who was running for political office, this is weird, but it's true, in Ville Platte, Louisiana, he wanted to take some of my images, make uh, plywood cutouts where you stick your face in the hole and you have this character image around you. And so uh, I said, well, yeah, sure. Um, so I, I licensed the rights to him for a limited period of time for X number of dollars to use X number of pieces of the, of the prints of the art pieces, uh, and so that was an easy $350 that he gave me, and I split that in half, and I gave the artist his half, and I kept my half as agent. Licensing success stories, the Monopoly game. Started, was, was created in 1933, this was during the Great Depression, by an unemployed man. He had the idea, he put it all together, he presented it to Parker Brothers. Parker Brothers took his intellectual property, distributed, manufactured it, and it's still being sold even today. Even though the man has died, his estate is still earning money every year from the Monopoly game that he did in 1933. Has anybody ever heard of the Cabbage Patch Dolls? Back in 1980-something, this guy named Xavier Roberts from Georgia had the idea to create this doll and, and with an adoption paper and all this stuff, and he had his own little gimmick that he used. Well, he licensed the rights to his intellectual property, to his design, to the manufacturer, two billion dollars worth of the dolls were sold. And so he made, I don't know what his percentage was as his royalty, but he made mega bucks. Now, anybody heard of Smurfs? Okay, what is Smurfs? It's a creative drawing. 
right? He came from somebody's mind onto paper. He presented that to a manufacturer, and they made the Smurfs uh, dolls, Smurfs art, everything, including the TV show, the cartoons. Well, that guy who created it licensed the rights to his uh, creativity to uh, different people. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were created by three guys who were artists and writers. They put that together into a package and sold that in different forms. The Duracell battery tester on the battery package. This came out about 10 or 15 years ago. This guy said, well, you know, he had this idea to take this battery tester and incorporate it into the, the battery package. Well, he approached the, uh, what I would consider the, the runner-up battery manufacturer, and they rejected him. So he went on to Duracell, and they say, yeah, yeah, we like that product. We'll go ahead and license you to, uh, you know, to license the, the product. And so he's making money off of that. Pound puppies, 50 million units sold. The guy who created it made a, a bundle on his licensing fees. Marketing, anybody here heard of Facebook and Twitter? Okay, build a following with social networking, with Facebook and Twitter, MySpace, whatever else that you're comfortable with. Learn all the ins and outs and how they work. MySpace is actually about to get shut down. Okay. Don't that. use MySpace. <laughs> uh, Y'all probably have an advantage over me. I know how to use Facebook a little bit. Twitter, I'm like totally blown out of the water with that. I don't know how that works and all. So I'm going to have to force myself to overcome another learning curve and learn how Twitter works so that I can market my, my products. And I'm <coughs> encouraging you to learn all about it, learn all the ins and outs, everything you can about social uh, networking uh, as a marketing tool. Here's the Smashwords uh, link. You can sell your book as an ebook online on smashwords.com and keep 85% of the profit. It doesn't like images. The Amazon Kindle, as an author, you can sell your book on the Amazon Kindle and other devices. Uh, there's other, like the Barnes & Noble has one now called the Nook. So you can uh, use those hardware devices to, to uh, put your book on online. Lulu.com, you can do hardcover art books coffee table books, lightningsource.com, you must be a publisher. What does that mean? All that means is you need to buy your ISBN, which is, I think it's a 13-digit code that goes on the back of your book. Uh, if you have an e-book, you need an ISBN for your e-book. Okay? So, that's what I had to do. I had to buy one for the physical book printed through my printer. I had to buy an IS, uh, use an ISBN for the lightning source version. <coughs> you can buy one and it'll cost you probably roughly about a hundred dollars maybe. I bought Five, let's see, why was that over? A hundred? Was it a hundred? I bought a hundred for... Five hundred, I think. Uh, five fifty? Five hundred dollars. That was five dollars a piece. Okay. okay. So you need one per book. One. you One per item. And then one... One per, per version. version. One per version. One per version. Yes. And then, yeah, okay. Smashwords provides eight different versions of a book. So you have to have eight different ISBNs for each version. Um, Suppose you have it in PDF. You have one ISBN for that. Suppose you have it in Microsoft Lit. 
That's another ISBN. Okay. Uh, okay, wait, let me make a correction there. Normally that is the case. If you go through anybody else directly, you would have to do that. But the good thing about Smashwords, even though they have they offer <coughs> your book in eight different formats, like I did, they're selling this uh, they're selling my rice cooker book through Smashwords. I bought one ISBN, put it on Smashwords, and they are using that same ISBN for all different, eight different versions. Now, if you would do it independently through whichever, however you want to do it, then yeah, it would probably require a different ISBN. So, to go through Lightning Source, you must be a publisher, get your own ISBNs, Another one, have you ever heard of Scribd.com? S-C-R-I-V-D.com. You can publish your articles, poetry, or whatever you want for free. Period. So, where to get your ISBNs? Go to MyIdentifiers.com and you'll see different packages they have there to offer you. And here's the resource guide if you haven't gotten this uh, at the beginning. RiceCookerMeals.com forward slash art is your uh, art page, uh, this uh, web page that you can go to to find books on publishing uh, and licensing. I will be putting some licensing courses, home study courses up there. And you can email me at neil at cypresscopepublishing.com. I'm open for questions. What about the topic? Everything you're talking about was like a book. What do you want to do with photography? I think I'll get a TV or a computer and I'll make a book. You want to make a gallery example. You want to make a photography book. Or like an e-book on a computer. An e-book of your photography. Uh, you would probably, let's see, you could probably put that together as a PDF file, okay? Create it as a PDF file, put, put all your art mm -hmm. in that one file, mm -hmm. and sell it from a, like your website. If you would have a website or get somebody to create a website for you, mm -hmm. you could sell it on there, put all your art, in that one file mm -hmm. and sell it from a, like your website. If you would have a website or get somebody to create a website for you, you can sell it on there. They'll pay you for it in advance using Visa MasterCard. You email them the link to your ebook. book And how many markets you get How do you market it? Um, okay. You had a question? What would you recommend if we did our work copyrighted before sending it out to be published or anywhere? Should we get, get it copyrighted first? Or? You can get it copyrighted. I recommend that you get it copyrighted. I think it's $40 now for a copyright. Uh, in case there's any kind of legal mess that would come up. You could uh, do it online. You could apply for it online. Uh, and uh, But according to the Copyright Act of 1977, once your intellectual property, your book, is in printed form and you put copyright uh, 2011, your name, and have it printed, you are protected according to the Copyright Act of 1977. Ben, you had a question? Um, I have a different one now, but um, so what's the difference between the copywriting and the um, uh, the intellectual property route? Are the, do you do those simultaneously? Or are they two separate? It's the same thing. Your, your intellectual property is your ideas that you put down in paper, or on a website, or in an ebook, 
paintings or whatever. Okay? okay. So, uh, if you take your, your paintings, your artwork, your printing, you can take all your whole collection and put them, uh, publish them in a file or publish them on hardcover, you know, paper. Uh, if, you, if you contain all of your images in one unit, you can put a copyright date on the copyright page and the whole shebang is copyrighted. Okay, you could have a hundred different art pieces, compose them into a book, get a copyright uh, application, fill it out, send them a copy of the book and one for yourself. That way, you're protected. Your art is protected. Who else has a question? I have one. In the ISBN, that's just the number for uh, sales. Am I right? Or is it just the... ISBN, let's see, it stands for International Book, uh, International Standard Book Number. And What is your question again? Is it for sales, like to count the sales or to recognize the sales? That is how the bookstore who has one million books, how will they differentiate your book from Joe Blow's book next to yours? So the ISBN number is incorporated into a barcode. So when they scan that barcode, it'll come up as your book. Because that has to be entered again when you present your book to them uh, at the store, the clerk will enter in your code number into the system so that the computer will recognize it from then on. They reorder. Uh, is there a difference between uh, what you would do for a copyright of a manuscript or artwork and what you would do for something that's like an invention? Yeah, uh, an invention goes through a different process. Okay, you would, uh, I'm, I would like to learn more about inventions and patents and uh, a pat that's, that's non, what you have to yeah, the patent. patents, yeah, it's a different the process. Rather than but copyright. Copyright, you can copyright your um, book, booklet, brochure, uh, musical recording, and so on and so forth. But a uh, product like a pen or a recorder or whatever, you have to go through the whole process of doing technical drawings, a description, and a friend of mine did a, uh, a friend of mine did one called the, um, it was a, a, a cooker, like a beer can cooker, uh, but she made it out of uh, stainless steel and use beer and whatever else, and she went through the whole process, cost her $10,000 to do the whole deal. But she's marketing her cookers around the state and making good money. And so do you do this full-time now? I do it full-time since June oh, 2005. And um, do you find that um, books are becoming, um, you know, less desirable as and going more towards online and you know all the different ways to get it. In my experience, the opposite is true. Uh, I make more by putting a physical book out in a store where people can see it than I do online. So when you started your publishing um, company, were you interested in publishing books? I took the opportunity to publish Keith Duyon's artwork. I was working full time for this other guy and I showed it to him because the packet was addressed to him. So I said, here look, you got a uh, a submission, a manuscript submission, and uh, it's for a Cajun coloring book. He thumbed through the art real quick and sneered at it. 
and says, this is, this is insulting to the Cajun culture. You know, uh, stereo, he called it stereotypical drawings of alligators and, you know, and so I said, okay. He says, uh, I have too much on my plate, I don't want to do it. Do you want to do it? If you want to do it, I give it to you. I release it to you to take it. I said, thank you. <laughs> so I took it, I put it together within just a few months, and like I said, I've sold 10,000 copies. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of ideas in my mind of things that I want to publish. I, even though I've only done one book for someone else, I am open to the idea of doing for others. Like if you have a, let's say a cookbook uh, that you want published, uh, we could, you know, work together on that. So. Neil, what I'm intrigued with is, is every book that, that you have dealt with or every publication it appears as though each one is unique in the marketing aspect of it. And uh, the thing that I've seen is I've, I've known people who've written books or they produce things or they've produced artwork, but uh, it, it seems like the, the link breaks when they get into marketing. How do you get it out in front of the people? Is there a, a philosophy that you hold since every one of them appears to be different and also the auxiliary of services that you offer with that. Uh, like she has a, a, a book of, of photographs of uh, wildlife, is it? Well, it's, it's just like I have, a, I have a photograph of an egret walking across a whole row of turtles I call Supporting Friends. Right. And it's really pretty. And, and it's my number one seller. And I want to do something with that concept of Supporting Friends of the egret walking across the world of turtles. Because usually turtles in a swamp, they jump when they see people. Right. And this is a unique picture, and I want to do something with it. It's one example. Can, can, uh, can you come up with some ideas on marketing? Uh, just using her as an example of uh, on photography, uh, either in a book form and or an individual form. And I want to do something on I have some blue birds. I want to do a story on Billy the Blue Bird, like, like a children's book. Billy Bluebird. I have a whole documentary of him and his wife and having babies and raising them and coming out of the nest and, and then, you know, he comes from a calling and, you know, and I wanted to do something, did something for children that would, that would be, um, well, if, if, if you get your book, I, I can't tell you how to publish, get your book published. But if you have your books published, and you have the books. But I want to do a photography. You're going to publish photography? All I'm saying is, if you want to sell them, you call, you're interested in Barnes & Noble, you call them up, uh, you'll get a salesperson, you tell them what you're interested in, and they will probably connect and say, you need to talk to so-and-so in this department will probably connect you with the right person. So there will, you run into some people who are not always nice, but most people are pretty nice. Yeah. Uh, 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 getting you to the right uh, person. I believe that. Mm -hmm. Right person. And, and just be called. Would you have to have it published first? Or they would just send it? They'll tell you who to contact? The Barnes and Noble does a lot. They just might. Yeah, it's by this guy called Peter Walsh, and it's actually very helpful. The only thing it's I can say to you... It's hard to get, get a publisher now. Yeah, you may have to pay. I'm like a editor, but do they have LSU publishing or something? Some place like that? I've never used... I've always done it myself. Mm -hmm. I've, I've always published my own stuff myself. I've never used another publisher to publish my stuff. Um, but one of the... One of the things that I find important is to pick a cover image that will sell the book itself. That's the okay. thing I see. When, when I put this together, I would walk into the store and I would hope that 
the person in charge was a woman. Because I can tell you almost 90% of the time when I walk into the store, I walk in with it like this. And when the woman would see it, she'd say, oh, look how cute. <laughs> and it is, it's cute. And she'd say, oh, wow. And she'd look in the back and look through it. And she'd look at the, the images and she'd laugh. i say, oh, I got her soul. <laughs> so it's an easy sell because the front cover is so cute. Uh, you could do the same thing. Pick an intriguing picture for the front cover that will absolutely sell. I say, oh, I got her soul. <laughs> so it's an easy sell because the front cover is so cute. Uh, you could do the same thing. Pick an intriguing picture for the front cover that will absolutely sell the book. That's the only thing I could tell And then, as far as marketing, get on the phone and start calling stores that would want to sell your product and would be a good fit. You wouldn't call an art store to sell a cookbook. Okay, so match your product with the store. And, and you call first, or do you ever just walk in? <coughs> I... I would call first, and because you you know let your fingers do the walking, and save yourself a lot of time and gas. Okay, call them, tell them what you have, and say, well look, if um, why don't you go online and take a look at the, the front cover, and, and you could, that's what I <clears throat> that's what I did. I had a website set up where they could go to the website, see the book, and I had 15 images from the book uh, on there. So that they can go to it and thumb through it and see the images and say, yeah, I want your book. That way they can call me and uh, order it and I'll send them whatever they need. What about the prints that you're there, just those individual prints? Those, uh, what about, how did I sell them? Yeah. I had a rack. I had a wire rack which was, it, it sat on the table but it was at a graduated level here where when you put the art print in, the, the one behind it would stick up higher, uh -huh. and the one behind it higher, higher, higher. And so I, I sold it like that. I had my art designer design a, uh, a color placard for the front of the rack that said Louisiana Landscapes, and it had a, had a thumbnail of all five images on the very front. Mm -hmm. What are you the rack at? Obviously, both. So I bought, you know, I bought three or four racks. I had her make me three or four of those color placards. So you had your main prints, and you took those to the stores. You put them on the front. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just creativity. Think of what would be the best fit for your products. Was there at any one point where you felt like regret or maybe? Like felt like it was too much, and you were jumping into something too big. Yeah, when I got married the second time. <laughs> <laughs> no, what you mean? Regrets, as in? Or just maybe not regret, but just maybe got a little worried with if you were going to be able to do it, make it happen. When I, the most worried I have ever been, was. When I started this, when I started this Cajun cookbook, I started this, okay, June 1st, 2005. Guess what happened in August 2005? <laughs> yeah, how, how big of an impact was that? Oh, major. Because I was planning on selling this book through Forest Sales because the company I was working for, Forest Sales was their biggest customer. Forest Sales sold 1,000 cookbooks a month for the company that I worked with because of the New Orleans market. August comes, Katrina comes, wipes out my whole New Orleans market. And at that time, 
the, the woman I was married to left me the month before. Thank God. <laughs> I'm serious. It was a major catastrophe. Uh, I was so much in debt because of stuff that she did. And so I was at the point of losing my home, okay? And I had credit card bills that she was doing behind my back I didn't know about. And so I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm going to sell my house. And so I went step by step, bit by bit, until November came, the book was printed, and started putting the books out in January, uh, December. Uh, and so, the, when the, the books I put out in December, I could collect some for in January. Take that money and pay off my credit card bill. And so on and so forth. So, stepping stones. My life was a series of stepping stones from one level to a higher level to a next higher level. And, like I said at the beginning, you're looking at a miracle. I would not have been able to walk into a room of this many people, much less stand up in front and say, everybody look at me. I would have been so insecure. Uh, growing up, I was severely abused verbally by classmates. I was the proverbial 95-pound weakling in a room full of linebackers and quarterbacks and fullbacks on the football team who won championship after championship, and so <clears throat> I was always inferior as how I felt in front of others. And so I carried that with me through my adult life, and uh, only by the grace of God and His work in my heart and through reading the Bible, God has helped me to overcome this. But like I said just a few years ago, uh, what, what really broke that off of me was 1977 I was invited to or kind of prodded into uh, being a participant in a talent show at our church and so so I don't have any talent don't look at me and so at the time I was working on a book called Cajun Humor and it was my job to go through all these cassette tapes of all these Cajun humorists and comedians pick the best joke and type them out and get them prepared to put in the book. But all this time that I'm doing that, I'm getting these thoughts. Wow, that's cool. Wow, you could do that. And, hmm, maybe I could do that. What would it be like to be on stage? And so the head of the talent show says, I'm looking for somebody to do a stand-up comedy routine. When she said that, I felt it like, oh, she's talking about me. So I decided, okay, I'll take some of the best jokes from what I heard, put together a 10-minute deal. I got up there, and I did it, and people were rolling in the aisles. Well, that broke that bondage off of me, which helped me to go up to a higher level. The next thing that really helped me out was there's a company in Baton Rouge called Fresh Pickens. It's a produce market. Vegetables, fruits, and all that. They had a vendor festival every year, and the guy, the manager, called me. He says, he knew about my book. He said, I want you to come and display your book and sell it in front of you know, all these people. He had to call me three times to, you know, like three successive weeks. I need your commitment. I want you to do it. So I was very hesitant to do it because fear, inferiority complex and all that junk. So I called my best friends and I asked them, a husband and wife, I said, would you mind coming with me to Baton Rouge? Please hold my hand. <laughs> that's, how, that's how I felt. You know, come with me. Back me up. I went there and after a half hour, man, I was getting crazy. You know, calling out to people, hey, come taste this. You know, I cooked this. Hey, I wrote a cookbook. Come see. And so I was getting, you know, getting free, getting crazy. So, and then so I've been doing uh, vendor festivals at the uh, Fresh Pickens in uh, Baton Rouge and Lafayette 
as well as doing the demos at Barnes & Noble. So, any other questions? I, I just wanted to comment that it, it sounded like you kind of had a plan and that uh, you took jobs that would give you the knowledge and experience that you needed to go farther in your and that's how. That's how it worked out. When so I was, instead of go, going to school, you took a job and you got paid to learn what you thought you were going to need. But I did. I did go. You. I did go to USL. But I mean, I have 120 college. something hours, but no degree, because I changed majors so many yeah. times. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Mm -hmm. You know. So, but yeah, it worked out that by getting the job. As a mail carrier for the city, I had time to think and plan, and when the job opening came up for a press operator, I took it. So, but it worked out, it worked out good for me. Is that it? I appreciate y'all coming and listening.